Well, there is a pressure, but you dissolve the pressure by working hard. If you feel the pressure and you buckle, or you feel the pressure and you don't put in the time or the prep, you're gonna choke. You use the pressure or you use the fear or challenge to just put in the time, you know? And it's up to you to fly with it, or try to. So The Ragged Child, it was the televised version of a play that I had appeared in with the National Youth Music Theatre, which was a young people's theatre company. It pulled together from auditions all around Great Britain, kids from all types of backgrounds. It was an interesting experience. I guess it was one of the first times I'd ever done the sort of the stop-start process of filming. It was very much an ensemble piece. So each of us sort of shared the weight of the responsibility of the piece, although the lead was played by Johnny Lee Miller, who obviously has gone on to have a wonderful career. So I, I view my time at the NYMT as a big part of my training, actually. I mean, your training never stops, but that was a real part of like stepping up and, and, and taking responsibility as an actor. Jerome Morrow, it's a nice name. It's my name. I can't be you without it. What makes you think you can be me at all? So I'd done a couple of other films, but Gattaca felt like a huge, huge break. First of all, to work with Ethan and Uma, Alan Arkin, Ernest Borgnine, Gore Vidal, this extraordinary group of highly regarded and talented individuals. I guess I was spoilt looking back because also to work on something that I just so believed in, unique, resonant, timely, political, had great style. But my memories of it were, wow, yeah, moving to LA for the first time. I was staying in one of these little kind of self-contained suites just up off Sunset, renting a, a Ford Mustang, <laughs> driving around, hanging out a lot with Ethan. Ethan and I got on very, very well, I remember. We filmed some of it in Marin County. We did that drive up the um, highway together, which took us a weekend. I mean, it really felt like um, first time I'd come to Hollywood and I was making a movie and it was a, it was a true, a moment of um, destiny and, uh, and and dreams. It's great that, that that film that early on in my career was a film that also stood the test of time. It's still a film, I mean, I've made about, God knows, 30, 40 films since then. That's still a film people talk about, which is really, it really meant something. There are a couple of others I did around that time which uh, they, people don't talk about so much, which is no bad thing. <laughs> oh, I can just imagine. If only Dickie would settle down. Doesn't every parent deserve a grandchild? Oh, God. Never. Never. I s swear on your ring, Marge. Never going back. A talented Mr. Ripley. I was making a film in London produced by Carolyn Choi. I was aware that Carolyn was married to Anthony Minghella. Anthony, by all accounts, was watching the rushes of this film come in and decided to offer me Dickie Greenleaf in my insane arrogance as a 20-something year old, hostile to the idea that I'd be cast as the sort of pretty boy, turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like, at the time that what I should really be doing is just playing like character roles and hunchback, just trying to find real weird, twisted uh, uh, characters. I luckily came to my senses and realized that he was putting together this extraordinary group of, of young actors and that he himself obviously having just won an sort of 50 Oscars or whatever it was for the English patient, was probably gonna be good, safe hands to put myself in. My experience of that particular film was absolutely golden, but it was also somewhat misleading in that I was sent, first of all, down to Ischia to get a suntan, learn to sail, and practice my saxophone. I've never since been given that kind of <laughs> carte blanche or invitation on any other job, sadly. I was overwhelmed with nerves because suddenly, you know, you have Gwyneth and Kate and Philip and Matt turning up alongside all these other great actors. I used the, the bravado and the confidence and the swagger of Dickie as a kind of way of pulling my way through that. And I think I sort of pretended I was Dickie basically for the whole time, which, which worked. It was very well received. It was the first time I got a nomination by the Academy. And so in many ways, it was a huge turning point in my life. It still sits in my heart as one of the most wonderful memories. Mm. Many a Mecca has gone to the end of the world, never to come back. That is why they call the end of the world Manhattan. And that's why we must go there. 
My memories of AI, wow, I mean, there are so many. So I went from the, the, the sun-kissed coast of Italy to East Germany, where I was filming Enemy at the Gates. I get this phone call from Steven Spielberg, which is the phone call most actors sort of spend a lifetime waiting for, and he was developing AI alongside Stanley Kubrick, who sadly passed away early, early on in the development of this particular version of the film. I would finish work in Berlin, fly to Paris, get on the Concorde, fly to New York, and land before I'd left. Get met on the runway at JFK with a helicopter and flown to Stephen's house. This is my to rehearse. If that doesn't make your head spin, nothing will. That kind of treatment is, well, for me, otherworldly. It was a really interesting experience in the hands of this extraordinarily powerful director. He was incredibly collaborative and we, um, came up with this idea of the dancing and the music and the, the guy was like a, a walking jukebox and he could play old classics and dance to them and seduce whoever he had to seduce. He was open to so many ideas and it was sort of, in a way, the challenge was just be as imaginative and as creative as you can and I'll see if we can do it. And most of the, most of the time he was like, yeah, we can do that. The makeup was uh, an extraordinary journey. Initially, they wanted to make a fake me, so they took a mold of my face and stuck the mask of me on my face. First of all, it made my head way too big, and secondly, it meant that you couldn't actually register anything I was doing. So we ended up just built these tiny little pieces that just made every line on my face perfectly symmetrical and straight. And then I also remember, because unfortunately it all grew back tenfold, they shaved almost all my hair off. Everything was shaved every morning, and they kind of sprayed me like a doll every morning and then polished me. Sitting in a chair for four hours and being transformed does help, because you you go in as one thing and you come out really looking and feeling as an, a, another. I had a rigorous routine that I went through every day with the choreographer. That discipline was also very important to sort of setting this physical neutral zone for Gigolo Joe to operate out of and getting the walk right. He walked, because he was a robot, we wanted certain things and certain moves to be repetitive. And if you watch the way he walks, he doesn't, you know, people walk like, he, he actually walked with a rhythm. He did this thing where he turns his head every other move. And um, so getting into that and locking that was an important ground zero to start at every day. Finding the character is, is finding the right look, the clothes, the makeup, the hair, all of that. And then you end up with what just feels right. And what do you do? I work wood. I mostly work wood. Well, Cold Mountain, so I'd started this extraordinary relationship with Anthony Minghella, and I remember him saying, come on the Odyssey with me. This is gonna be this huge physical journey. And it was, we, we battled the seasons and the elements every single day. It was deeply emotional too, because a lot of my character's journey was physical. I remember also I had this big relationship with animals in that Anthony wanted all the animals to be real, so I was always fishing and learning to cut cows open and pull chickens' heads off and all of that stuff. It was very hands-on. If you're up a mountain in six foot of snow, you're up there with a the crew. If you're in a bog or if you're in a swamp with um, gators, you know, six feet away, they're in there with you. So it's a very bonding experience to go from baking heat to sub-zero temperatures and, and everything in between. It's all about the people around you. If you're with a really wonderful group of people and the part requires it and they, they're there with you, then, then absolutely you do it again. Please tell me the truth. Why? Because I'm addicted to it. Because without it, we're animals. I'd seen Closer on stage in London and in New York. Again, Mike Nichols, a director just of legend. A dream team. I mean, how lucky am I? You know, suddenly I'm in the room with these other three wonderful, wonderful actors. I remember the rehearsal process was really interesting. We rehearsed it in New York. We read through the script, but most of the time we really just listened to Mike recounting stories of his love life. I remember halfway through saying to each other, like, maybe we're not gonna input anything. And what I realized he was doing was he was sort of laying his life bare in order to feel safe. It was like he was, it's like he was in confession. And so suddenly anything we discussed, anything we shared, because the piece is about meeting and breaking up with the loves of your life. So it's always dealing with the most raw, the most intimate, the most revealing and, 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 and vulnerable moments. And in a way he was, going through this process of confession of, and, and, and allowing the 
conversation to always be safe, which worked. We shot it in and around London, which was a real treat because uh, I was at home. So much of London now, I drive past and I think, oh yeah, I filmed there, or, oh gosh. And so suddenly these little landmarks in my hometown are also touchstones of memories, you know. But sadly, there's this, the one strip, the scene at the very beginning when I uh, spy Natalie Portman coming through the crowd, Spitalfields Market, has been completely demolished. The shops have all gone and it struck me the other day how sad that was because I have such vivid memories of shooting that scene. The play, those who know the play will know that the ending in the play is very different, or at least it goes a little further and we filmed that ending. Although it's quite an eccentric ending. My character, Dan, calls the other two together and sort of has this breakdown where he describes that Alice, Natalie's character, has died. And he goes through this whole confessional where he discovers that she's stolen her name from the memorial of this young woman back in the Victorian age. The only way I could make sense of this scene was to play it like he had kind of gone a little crazy. And then they cut the scene. Quite rightly, the rhythm works much better the way it is, but I've always taken it that it must be because I was really awful in this scene. Because I do remember making quite a bold decision to play him slightly wacky that he'd kind of called these two people together and was confessing something, but um, hopefully that's not the case. I cry all the time. You do not. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you don't have to be this nice. Uh, it happens to be the truth. <laughs> really? A good book, great film, uh, a birthday card, I weep. <laughs> I'm a major no, no. weeper. <laughs> the films we've mentioned, The Holiday is one that is reminded to me most often. I guess because it's seasonal. A lot of people come to me every year and say, oh, we watch that every holiday, we watch that every Christmas. That's our favorite Christmas film. And there are a few funny memories I have of that. The first is that we shot the exteriors in the UK first. It was freezing. For whatever reason, all the interiors, the UK interiors too, were filmed in uh, uh, the studios here in LA. So we all moved to LA. Nancy has the, uh, Oh, I don't know if she does anymore, but she has the reputation for taking her time. I'm sat in my uh, house waiting for five weeks before they get to me. As you can probably see, if I look at the sun, I go very brown very quickly. My father is very dark skinned. And if you watch that film carefully, <laughs> when I'm outside in England, I'm really white and pasty. As soon as I go inside, I'm like, hey, and I've got this suntan. <laughs> no one really notices, but if you watch, I darken by about two shades every time I step inside and out. I've worked with Kate three or four times and that was, I think, the second. It was a wonderful time. We, our kids were both very little and we would laugh a lot. Getting to know Cameron was a great experience. She's so much fun. It was a very happy time. It was hard work. I mean, a lot of my scenes were with the kids. We could only shoot with them till lunch. So in the morning, I was behind the camera just trying to make these children laugh and sticking like dolls in my mouth, pulling funny faces and putting things on my head to make them keep attention with me and, and then they would go at lunchtime and like, you'd be exhausted. It'd be like you've been running a crash all morning, right? And then they turn around and they're like, right, you've got to do the same thing now. And I always remember being like, oh God, bringing a clown next time for the, for the kids' close-ups. I think it was one of the first times I'd done an out-and-out -out comedy. Well, no, I'd done comedy, but I, I wanted to do it because uh, Nancy related it to some of my favorite old rom-coms. She wanted it to be sort of arsenic and old lace, kind of slightly goofy, funny, but romantic and heartfelt. And they're tricky, they're, much, they're very technical. A lot of it's rhythm. They always say, actually, doing drama is sometimes more fun than doing comedies. Doing comedies, it's like, do it again, be funny this time. That's hard. My waistcoat. I thought we agreed it's too small for you. I'd like it back. I thought we agreed. I want it back. So Sherlock Holmes, I get this phone call. I just remember being really curious. I, I, I mean, it was a part I'd never considered playing. John Watson, Dr. Watson in a Holmes. But of course, they mentioned Downey and Guy and this bizarre equation, suddenly I thought, God, this could, this could be disastrous or this could be absolutely genius. I spend this afternoon with Robert. I really don't want to be one of these actors who, 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 who just says, ah, oh, I just fell in love with this actor. And, but honestly, me and Robert fell in love <laughs> this afternoon and we were like these children giggling. And we just had a very compatibility, I think, our sense of humor, our view on the world. He's the most um, brilliant, eccentric, quick-witted, and lovely man. You have to realize that Iron Man had only just come out. In fact, I don't even know whether it had been released. He'd shot it, and it was pretty obvious what was gonna happen. 
The whole thing became, honestly, a really uh, enjoyable experience. We would run the pages in the morning, improvise a whole bunch. I kept this thing called the Bible, which was all these quotes from the Conan Doyle books. You know, swap out lines that we'd improvise with lines actually by Conan Doyle and rewrite stuff. And then we'd go shoot it, and we'd shoot it really quickly. And obviously alongside that, there was all this incredible physical stuff, stunts, horse riding, fights. But it was a very happy, very, very happy job and fun to be on a set that scale, you know. It had a lot of money behind it. Guy runs a very happy set, a lot of music being played. I think while we were cooking that one, we were already thinking about the second. This is the most complicated one I've ever seen, by far. Well, Hugo, so I'd already worked with Marty on The Aviator to work with someone of his caliber and import is just kind of dream come true, really. So to be asked to go back and do it, play another part was wonderful, real compliment. I'd read the book to my children. It was a really important book, actually. I mean, I, I read to my children, I, I don't anymore, but I used to read to my children all the time. This particular book had a real impact on them because there are pages of, um, of text and then there are all the, wonderful illustrations that go on for pages and pages and pages, which are quite, you know, you can interpret and the story sort of takes on the dream quality that the children can comment on. So I had a real attachment to it. Just just being able to sit back and observe Martin Scorsese's energy on a set, you know, great way to learn and a great way to be inspired about the art form, passion he has, insight and the knowledge he has of the um, history of film. It's really infectious. Who's this interesting author? I inquired of Monsieur Jean. To my surprise, he was distinctly taken aback. Don't you know? He asked. Don't you recognize him? Like so many other people, I had just been a huge fan of Wes Anderson's for years and years, right back to Bottle Rocket. I would turn to his films like holidays. Life Aquatic was a film I would disappear in, and life always felt better in a Wes Anderson film, even if you were going through a breakup. There was just something about the aesthetic and the, the, the worlds he created that you wanted to be in. And I wrote to him. It's just something I do quite a lot, but I wrote to him just you know, thanking him and dropping huge hints that if he ever wanted to cast me, I'd be more than happy to work with him. Uh, and we ended up meeting in a very Wes Anderson place. Uh, we went for tea at Claridge's, and he quite rightly turned up in a, in a, in a tweed suit and tie and slippers. He then, this is a funny story though, he said, he said, yeah, there is a part for you. I, I'm gonna send you this script, and I, I, the character's called The Author. So I turn the first page, and it says, first thing, author. I'm like, oh my God, next page, author. Author, oh, I'm thinking, oh my God, it's the lead. Six pages in, it goes, cut back, 15 years. I'm like, oh no. Basically, I bookend it. But you know, it was still, <laughs> it was still a wonderful uh, opportunity. And I, I, I flew out to, oh, this little border town up in the mountains of Germany and Poland. Literally, run, I go running a lot, and I'd go running in the morning when it wasn't. We stayed, all of us, together in this little hotel, which they use in the film. And um, all the cast would stay, and then we'd all have dinner together at night. We'd go and watch uh, reference films and what have you in, in, in Wes's suite. And then they took over this old communist department store, which became the, 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 the lobby. And one of my earliest memories of that was, uh, they, they built a little gym for those who wanted to use one. And I went in and I was training in the morning, and. F. Murray Abraham came in and he said, um, do you mind if I warm up? And I was like, come on, do what you're doing. And what I didn't think was he was talking about vocally. <laughs> so I'm sat there doing sit-ups and I'm just hearing And he just stood there. Because of course, F. Murray Abraham you know, has this incredible voice. And he, he, so he was warming up vocally while I'm doing weights, going like this. Fantastic. However long you keep me and my friends under surveillance, you're not going to discover plots against you, Travers, because we want the same thing, the defeat of Grindelwald. I read my children Harry Potter, took them to see the films, and I loved Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I don't remember at what point, but someone suddenly said, oh, you know, they're gonna want a Dumbledore. I went through a, an audition process, and it was a process I hadn't done in a while, and it was, it was fun to do because you also felt like you wanted to make sure you were married to this part. You didn't want to get it and buckle because there's a great responsibility that comes with playing Albus Dumbledore. I think one of the, uh, the beautiful moments in preparation was working with J.K. Rowling, and I spent an afternoon where she just gave me the entire history of, of this great character, and I remember she uh, I went in and she was having tea. She had these incredible heels on, 
she said, um, OK, she said, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up. And she stood up for nearly three hours and just walked up and down, talk, talk. It just came out of her. I mean, it's just living in her. And I'm sitting there scribbling down notes and getting all this incredible insight into this character, which, you know, I had a little opportunity to use in this current one. And then next year I go ahead and we do another chapter. So there's more to come with that. There's something wonderful about embodying someone with magical power and trying to understand what that might be like. But there's also something painful about Albus, something sad. Just a beautiful literary character that, that was a real, it's a real privilege to be able to bring to life. There are two of us, John. You're gonna have to deal with me. There is no dealing with the devil. You are a danger to others. A rash, unreasonable child. It doesn't matter. I am the Pope. I was coming to the end of a job, really trying to get a sense of what do I want to do and who's out there and what's happening. And, you know, I'm one of these people. I'm always making lists and I try and see as much as I can because I'm also a big film fan. I'd seen uh, Il Divo and I'd seen La Grande Bellezza and uh, Paolo was absolutely at the top of this list. And then you sort of sit there thinking like, well, how do I make that work? Maybe I need to learn Italian. And I promise you, within a week, I get a letter from Paolo saying, oh, I have an idea. Will you meet me? We sit down and he's written this two-page document about this young American Pope who drinks Cherry Coke Zero and smokes Marlboro Lights. This conservative, dogmatic, terrifying reformist who doesn't believe in God. <laughs> I had to stop myself salivating, I think, in front of him. He started writing and this extraordinary web of, 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 of intrigue and character and, and politics and social economic politics in the back rooms of the Vatican started to come together and I started learning Latin. That was my greatest fear with all the, the speeches in Latin. I started learning those months before because well, I found them very hard to learn. I do a lot of theater, so I don't find lines hard to learn, but learning another Latin, that was very hard. It was uh, an extraordinary experience living in Rome for nine months, working with this team who have made almost every film with Paolo that worked like clockwork in silence around him. It's like, you know, he is famous for these extraordinary set pieces, but he comes on set, he, he makes his decision and we, there's no hanging around. It's not like you're sat waiting for him to work it out or practice it hours on end. It's a very swift process. I mean, it, there was also a strange sort of sense of zen because 99% of the time they were speaking Italian. Lenny, Lenny has this sort of almost insular world that he, that he operates from. And so people speaking another language around me helped me kind of disappear into this world and behind this veneer. And I work with this acting coach I've been working with for about 10 years and she's always saying to me, you are enough, you are enough. And what she means by that is you do the work and you don't need to show everyone how hard you're working. Some actors do, but you know, I think it's more effective when you do the work and you're just then present. And Lenny was a real great opportunity to, tr to put that to practice, to try and have faith in stillness and faith in presence over projection. Let the presence be the projection. And then, you know, we had the keys to the city. It was extraordinary. We were, we were filming in palazzos and gardens that no one ever gets to see. They were like opening up uh, treasure troves. It was extraordinary to go to work every day and see these historical, significant spaces and, 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 and wonders. We completed it and to me that was the beginning and the end of Lenny Bellardo and then about uh, seven months, eight months later, Paolo calls me and says that he's got an idea of maybe how to take the story further. He told me it in Venice the day we premiered The Young Pope and I would not have been interested had it not been anything other really than what he's done. I would consider myself an existentialist. I was turned on to it first by David Cronenberg when I made Existence, and he turned me on to Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Camus. What I realized was that it was a kind of natural state of mind, one that I'd been living in and by since I was a teenager, really. It's this idea of taking responsibility and trying to live in the present. It's like a kind of faith in a way that I think you need to mature it because every time you shift in your life or you take on board something else or you have a new relationship or your world expands, it needs applying to. But I've always been intrigued by it and it's, it's not something I necessarily conquered or achieved, but it's something that I've, I've been um, drawn to and that I find uh, spiritually fulfilling. That's interesting. I've not necessarily seen it that clearly in my work, but I think you're right. It's a good observation. I'm thrilled you said that. <laughs> I'm going to steal it. If ever asked to sum up my career, I'd say, existentialism. <laughs>